Hey pre-calc students, today we're going to talk about lesson 1.6 part 1. The topic today is inverse functions. You've heard the word inverse before in mathematics. Um, you just probably forgot what it really means. So inverse is kind of like, think of operations like addition. The inverse of addition, so what undoes addition is subtraction. The inverse of multiplication is division. Essentially, there are inverse functions. So you've talked about inverse operations like adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing, but now we're going to talk about inverse functions. So of an actual full function, you can have an inverse of it. Now the first thing that I want to review with you guys is notation. You should have seen this notation before. This is something that you probably covered in advanced algebra. Um, so the original function f of x, right, would be written in inverse form as f to the negative 1 parentheses x. But again, you don't read it as f to the negative 1 power. This is the inverse of f of x. Okay, so make sure you're not actually saying f to the negative 1 power. It, that means inverse. Now, what are some properties of inverse functions? Well, the main one that I want you guys to focus on is that functions that are inverses have the exact same x and y values, except they are reversed. What does that mean? Well, take a look at the graph that I have of these two lines. There's the navy blue line and there's the red line, okay? Every ordered pair on the red line is also on the navy blue line, except the x and the y values are flip-flopped. I know my negatives got, kind of got cut off a little bit here, but negative 9 comma 0 is, n, is an ordered pair in f of x, and 0 negative 9 is an ordered pair in the inverse of f of x. That is always true about inverse functions. How come? Well, because every single ordered pair is reflected over the line y equals x. That line is visible on the graph. It's that diagonal line with a slope of 1 that passes through the, y, the y-intercept of 0. Okay, So that is always true. Inverses are always reflected over the line y equals x. Now be careful because that's not the same as reflected over the origin um, or reflected over the x-axis or y-axis. So this is a different type of reflection. This is reflected over a, a, the diagonal line y equals x. Again, the main relationship between inverse functions is that they have the same exact ordered pairs except the x's and the y's switch places. Because that happens, the domain of f of x is actually the range of its inverse. And that's what I cover over here in this box. Since the x values of f of x are the y values for f inverse, then the domain of f of x is the range of f inverse. The same is true vice versa. The range of the function f of x is the domain of its inverse. We'll do a few examples to cover these two basic properties. Example 1. m of x and n of x are inverses. If n of 9 equals 1, what is the value of m of negative 1? Whew. Okay, seems kind of overwhelming. But let's break it down. They're talking about two different functions. m and n. m of x and n of x. What information was given and what information do they want? The given information was about n of x, which I color coded in red. So n of 9 equals negative 1. This is function notation for an x value of 9 and a y value of negative 1. If you remember the definition of inverse functions and the fact that the x and y values are the same, just reversed, 
then we can write that m of x has the ordered pair 9, negative 1, but in backwards order, negative 1, comma, 9. How does that help me? Well, if I write negative 1, comma, 9 in function notation, I get m of negative 1 equals 9. And that's exactly what the question was asking. What is the value of m of negative 1? 9. Pause, rewind, do anything that you need to do to make sure that this sits well in your brain, okay? So feel free to send me a message I remind if you want more examples. But again, they gave you an ordered pair for a reason. You need that ordered pair so you can reverse the x and the y values to give the ordered pair for the one they were asking. Next question. The domain of g of x is bracket 0 to infinity and its range is negative infinity to 2, bracket. If g of x and h of x are inverses, what is the range of h of x? Again, that's a lot, a lot of information. So let's just focus on the fact that we're talking about two functions, g of x and h of x. Let's write down what we know. g of x has a domain of x values from 0 to infinity. It is important for you to know that those are x values, and remember that. We learned that previously in this chapter. The range, we have, which has to do with the y values, is negative infinity to 2. So this is the information that was given to us. We somehow need to use that to tell them about h of x. Now remember, the main relationship between inverse functions is that the x, y, the x values become the y values and the y values become the x. So essentially, the domain, which used to be x values, now are going to become the y values and the y values become the x values. So the range of g of x is now the domain of h of x. Now notice, I am not switching the order of these two values. That quality of switching the x and the y and reversing them is for ordered pairs. Domain and range are not ordered pairs, even though there's a comma. Those are both x values here. And then range is they're both y values. So you are not switching the order here at all because they're not ordered pairs. In example one, I gave you ordered pairs, and all you had to do was switch the x and the y. Here you're switching as an entire group the domain and the range. So again, the y values now become the x values. So look at the gray arrows, and the x values become the y values. Besides knowing these basic qualities of inverse functions, you also need to know how to find an inverse on your own using algebraic steps when a graph isn't provided. This is something that you guys should have covered in advanced algebra, but again, it's been a while, so let's review. If I want to find the inverse of a function, and the main relationship that I've memorized about inverse functions is that the x and the y switch places, then I can essentially do the same thing for these, except first and foremost, as I read example three, there is no y. There's no visible y. But quick reminder, ordered pairs in function notation are written as f of x equals y. So think about that. f of x is the y. The first thing that I recommend is replace the f of x with the y. That's step one. Step two is switch the x and y by the, because of the definition of inverses. So put the x where the y used to be and put the y where the x used to be. 
don't worry about all the other numbers. Leave the other numbers and symbols and operations where they are. Just literally replace the X with a Y and the Y with an X. Step three, or sorry, we're still on step two. So switch the X and the Y and solve for Y. Now, when you are solving for Y, you are using the inverse order of operations. So you are going to cancel addition and subtraction first, multiplication or division, then exponents and roots, and finally grouping symbols. Some of you guys remember PEMDAS, which is please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, but when you're solving, when they ask you to solve, you're using the backwards order of operations. Now, yes, we're supposed to cancel addition and subtraction, multiplication, division, exponents and roots, and finally the grouping symbols. But if you notice the addition and subtraction, or sorry, the addition and the multiplication are both part of that grouping symbol of the root. They're both inside the root. So instead of starting by canceling the four, since it's stuck inside the root, and just let me show you that this is really negative three times y plus four, okay? So this step is optional. You don't have to rewrite it if you don't want to, but it makes it easier to see that there's a negative three multiplied with y, and then there's a plus four. If I want to get rid of the negative three and the plus four, I first need to free them and get them outside of this root. So I'm going to get rid of the root first, which in this case counts as a grouping symbol. It's a square root, but if I square it, it will cancel out. X to the second power is just X to the second power. And now I'm free of the root that was over the negative 3y plus 4, and I can now concentrate on solving for y. Remember, we're solving for y. We're trying to get that y by itself. I'm going to cancel addition and subtraction first. x squared minus 4 is not, they're not like terms. Notice that they're not like terms, so they're a binomial. Sorry about that, guys. And then when you are canceling, um, I just realized I didn't color code these. Okay, so when you're trying to cancel multiplication, you're going to divide, but you're dividing both of these by negative 3. So you can put it all over negative 3 and see if it reduces, or what I like to do is I'd like to divide them individually. You do this anytime you have a binomial. So I'm going to write you a little note that remember this is a binomial. There were two terms, so both of them have to be divided by negative 3. Now the nice thing is that we're finally going to have y by itself. But if you remember, there never was a y to begin with. So your final answer for step 3 is to reduce your left side of your equation, okay? So my answer is going to be negative one-third x squared because there's a one in front of the x squared and one divided by negative three is negative one-third plus four-thirds. I didn't give myself enough room in the box. And this is the answer to the inverse of f of x. So it is important for you to name your answer correctly. So it's not y equals negative one-third x squared plus four-thirds. It's f inverse. So let's follow the same process for example four. Inverses have the same ordered pairs, except the x's become the y's and the y's become the x's. So if I'm essentially going to do the same thing here, first thing I need is a y. You replace the f, f of x with y. That's step one. Step two, switch the x with the y. Now remember, we're not switching signs. We're just literally switching the variables. So put the x where the y was. Oops, that's a three, not a five. Just realized that. Pew, 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 pew. After you switch them, you have to solve for y. 
Okay, so after you switch the x and the y, you have to solve for y. Remember, you're using SADMEP or backwards order of operations, so you're going to cancel addition and subtraction first. One time on the left side, one time on the right. x minus 3 is just x minus 3. Then I'm going to cancel multiplication or division. I like to cancel fractions with the reciprocal. Again, remember this is a binomial. There are two terms, so both of them need to be multiplied with two. Both of them. So put parentheses if you need to. So that gives you 2x minus 6. Remember that the 1 half canceled with its reciprocal of 2 over 1. And according to SADMEP, I'm supposed to cancel um, the fifth power next. So I'm going to go ahead and take the fifth root. Exponents and roots are inverses. You have not learned how to simplify the fifth root of a binomial. I don't think you've even done the square root of a binomial. So I purposely gave problems that do not simplify when you're taking a root of a binomial, so you can go ahead and leave it like that. However, remember that the y was never there. So it is not okay to say y equals the fifth root of 2x minus 6. They asked you for the inverse of f of x. So make sure that you write your answer with the appropriate notation. Yes, it will be wrong. I am so picky with that. There was no y. We put it there for our own purposes, so make sure you name it correctly. The last thing that you should be able to do that has to do with inverses is to prove whether or not two functions are inverses. And the way you're going to do that is to use composition. The reason I chose this method is because it helps us practice g of f of x and f of g of x, so composition of functions, which we learned in section 1.5. On a test or a quiz, I might give you two functions and ask you to tell me whether they are or are not inverses. In order to do that, you have to prove that both compositions equal positive 1x. If, if only one of them equals positive x, that's not good enough. They both have to equal positive x. So I'm going to find f of g of x, simplify and see if I get just 1x, and I'm going to do the same with g of f of x. When I taught composition, I recommended that you color code your functions. So for f of g of x, I'm going to take the f function, copy it, replace the x, and leave myself enough room so I can substitute the g function into it. Remember, that's what this means. It means take, it means substitute g of x into f of x. This one means substitute f of x into g of x. So if I set that one up, and I'll come back to f of g of x, but if I set this next one up, I'm going to copy the g function, replace the x with parentheses, and substitute f of x. My next step is to simplify, not solve. When you are simplifying, you're using regular order of operations, which most of you learned as PEM does. So that includes distribution, combining like terms. So negative 2 thirds times negative 3 halves, those are reciprocal, so they multiply to positive 1. Negative 2 thirds times negative 9 is 18 over 3, which is 6. 
drop down the minus 6, clean it up, combine like terms, and notice that we get 1x. That is a good sign towards having proof that they are inverses, but that's not enough. You need to prove that this next composition also equals 1x. Negative 3 halves times negative 2 thirds is 1x. Negative 3 halves times negative 6 is 18 over 2, which is 9. Bring down the minus 9. And now we have enough evidence to say that yes, they are. Yes, they are inverses. As always, guys, if you have any other questions or you still need help, reach out to me on Remind or send me an email. Have a great day.